Good morning, everybody. I think uh, there are still going to be a few people wandering in, but if we don't start, we're going to be late finishing, so I shall kick off. So welcome to the final plenary of the conference. Time has really flown. It doesn't seem a minute since we started, so uh, it's great to be, to be here. I'm Gillian Lang, and I'm co-chairing this final session with, with Holger, Holger Schinnemann, who you all know. Important to note that this session is going to take us to about 12.30 and then run straight into the closing session. So please stay in your seats. It will all be wrapped up by 1 p.m. So this session is called Choice or Decision, Transparency. And I think transparency is really key for guideline developers because the more transparency, the more trust. I think that's really key. So for this session, we've got three great speakers, the usual format of an initial presentation, one or two clarification questions, and then a panel discussion at the end. So I'm delighted to welcome the first speaker, Andre Picard, health economist at the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper, and last year named Canada's top newspaper columnist. So really looking forward to, to your talk. Who said that? and why. Andre. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. Now you've had a few days of presentations from experts about how to strengthen the quality, the efficiency, equity, and the reach of your guidelines. You've tackled a host of technical, policy, and ethical issues. Really high-level stuff. So now for something completely different as they used to say on Monty Python's Flying Circus. Now you get to hear from a journalist, the ultimate non-expert. And I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about how, how guidelines are developed. Uh, I know a little bit about how, about how they're disseminated, not especially well in my view. And I'm a casual, occasional user. Sometimes I'll be writing an article and need to refresh my memory. At what age do you, are you supposed to get screening mammography again? And then I realize, well, apparently that depends on geography, not on medicine. Or I hear criticisms of an approach, so I might wonder, what does Choosing Wisely think about this? They're always a good guide. So what do I have to offer today as a speaker when you're all desperate to get home? Well, what I want to do in the short time I have this morning is talk about how guidelines are perceived by lay people, uh, from journalists to patients to policymakers. And the good news is that I don't have any slides. I figure by this point you're PowerPointed to death, uh, so I'm just going to talk. Now, as someone who's a veteran health and science communicator, I also hope to offer up some practical tips about what academics like to call knowledge translation. Uh, we simple people have a different name for it. We call it useful information. So the question I want to try and answer is this one. How do you make guidelines more useful to the people they should ultimately benefit? Patients. In other words, how do you make them more consumer friendly, more accessible? And I've struggled with this a bit though. Uh, I'm a long time proponent of democratizing medicine uh, at the health system more generally, which is profoundly undemocratic, by the way. I'm a big advocate for better health and science communication and patient power. But too often, those who do have power think that empowering patients simply consists of throwing information at them a bit like throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing if it sticks. And it's not particularly useful. What patients need is accessible, comprehensible information. Most of all, they need information that's actionable. And I'm going to use that word over and over again, because there's a lot of information out there that's just not useful. So what do we do with guidelines? I'm a bit of two minds. I think guidelines should principally be written for decision makers, clinicians, and increasingly policy makers. So they have to be worded well, they have to be complex. But we can't forget that patients, and sometimes their families, are decision makers too. They need a version of this information. But maybe sometimes it has to be a different version. So I think the discussion that's needed is how to do this most effectively, and I'll address that in a bit. But first, I want to talk about the elephant in the room. Or maybe I should call it now the elephant lurking outside the room, because we're not acting like we're in a pandemic anymore. We're acting like it's over. 
As you heard in the introduction, I've kind of been obsessed about COVID-19 since uh, I first met, wrote my first story in January 2020. And COVID-19 has taught us many, many lessons, good and bad. The single most important one, though, I think, is that it has really underscored the importance of good communication. Nothing has been more essential. The single most important tool in our, our public health kit during this whole pandemic has been words, not anything else, words. And we haven't done a particularly good job. All the technology and the medicine in the world isn't of much use if you can't communicate it, if you can't get buy-in from the public. And I should note here that there's not just one public anymore. There are many publics. Increasingly, you have to target your messaging. For example, some guidelines will have to be targeted at clinicians, some at policymakers, some at patients. And you have to do it differently at different times because needs change. Now, during the pandemic, there's been an insatiable appetite for information, for advice on how to survive and how to thrive. This has been a mixed blessing. Uh, we see it in my business, journalism, very blatantly. Our subscriptions, our web hits, they soared to record levels. At the same time, the hatred for the media has flourished. Shooting the messenger is no longer just a metaphor, unfortunately. And scientists have seen this exact same uh, thing play out. We desperately want their information, but when we don't like it, we hate them, not the message. Information and misinformation have been weaponized in the last two, three years. We're not sure who to believe, what to believe, who to trust. Trust has been lost to an incredible degree. And as you know, trust is a lot easier to lose than it is to regain. It's going to take years, if not decades. It's left us all a bit shell-shocked, especially people like yourselves, who are scientists for the most part. Now, nothing underscores the importance of good communication more than the story of COVID mass vaccination. About 90% of eligible Canadians have had their first two shots. We have one of the highest rates in the world. But fewer than half have had a third shot, and a tiny percentage a fourth. Only 6% of our kids have been vaccinated. We had good up uptake of vaccines at first, and it's not a coincidence that we had really clear messaging. But as we learned more about the benefits and limitations of vaccines, the messaging got more complex and unfortunately more muddled. We stopped believing and started doubting. You may not recall this incident from the spring of 2021, but it's one that sticks in my mind. In that period where vaccines were first made available, that was February to April 2021 in Canada, there was a stampede for shots. Literally, people were lining up for blocks. And we started having debates about what vaccine is best. In Canada, we have Pfizer and Moderna, and we had AstraZeneca. At the time, there were some troubling stories about AstraZeneca vaccine being associated with heart problems, particularly in younger people. Never mind that the absolute risk was infinitesimal. It was still a story. Everything was a story back then. You sneezed and it was a story. So our Chief Public Health Officer, Theresa Tam, was asked at a press conference if people should take the AstraZeneca vaccine. Really big question on the public's mind. Or should they wait for stocks of the Pfizer vaccine to be replenished? Could we afford to wait a few days before getting our shots? Those were the glory days. She gave a long answer about evolving science, risk-benefit frameworks, and promised more advice would be available before individuals were given a second shot. People hadn't had a first. So the question, do I wait or do I not wait, it was never answered clearly. A few, de few days later, NACI, which is Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization, gave its advice, and it was equally confusing. A long rec recitation of, well, on the one hand, but on the other hand, and on the third hand. From a communication perspective, it was a disaster. It was the first big crack in public faith in COVID-19 vaccines, and it set the stage for much more doubt, and doubt is poisonous in public health. So why do I tell this story? Because I think it's a cautionary tale for those of you who produce guidelines and recommendations and the like. Scientists like to be precise. They like caveats. The public's very different. They want black and white. They want simple, do I do this or do I not do this? You have to be able to bridge that divide 
especially if there's a high profile, fast moving challenge like a pandemic virus. Now, I'm not sure exactly how you do that. I now know how you don't do it, but I'm not sure how you do it. But what I tell scientists is, be careful with your language. Say things like this. This is what I recommend based on the current evidence. Use things like most likely scenario. This is the most likely scenario that I think is going to happen. Don't talk about best or worst cases. Make it digestible. One of the biggest public health challenges during COVID was that scientists had these, you know, how many angels can dance on a pinhead debates, and they had them in public forums. There's a place for that, but it's probably not on Twitter. They argued about f fundamental things like, do vaccines work? But they got caught up in debating nuance. Are they 93 or 86% effective? That doesn't matter to the public, they work. That's the message that needed to be driven home. Is the interval dose best three or four months? I don't care. Tell me, get it pretty soon. There's a place for this kind of debate, this precision, but again, it's not on social media. It's not on a CBC call-in show. Again, it just creates doubt and confusion. Another example of the difficulty of giving advice were the infamous drugs hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. There's a lot of treatments being touted by scientists and non-scientists alike. And it was hard to figure out whose research and advice was credible. Clinicians and the public alike were unsure and confused. Could a horse deworming drug really treat and even prevent COVID? Should I rush to the feed store to get some? Some smart people actually did, unfortunately. The political and social environment in which advice is given makes a big difference. When the President of the United States stands up and touts something as a miracle drug, do carefully worded recommendations really matter? It's a difficult environment for you. Uh, the people tasked with developing COVID-19 guidelines on vaccines, on therapeutics, on everyday behavior like masking, they had an unenviable task and one that's only gotten more difficult. Everyone from politicians to the public urgently wanted advice, despite the limited research and evidence. So when the advice changed based on changing evidence, that was seen as proof of backpedaling, of incompetence, instead of what it really was, science evolving. It was an unusual to have dueling committees of experts offering contradictory advice. What does the public do with that? No, they make their own decisions, often nonsensical ones. Because of their affiliations or areas of expertise, guideline makers were sometimes seen as having vested interests or conflicts of interest. And sometimes they did, and we weren't transparent about that, and that burned them. Other experts, real and self-proclaimed, contradicted and criticized the guideline makers, often, once again, using social media platforms, not traditional scientific publications. During the pandemic, the way the research was done changed too. There was a mania for preprints that hasn't abated. Social media posts have trumped peer-reviewed publication. I don't think that's good for science. Maybe it's good for people's publication numbers, but not science. And of course, there are publications like predatory journals and alternative medicine websites that are seen as equally credible as peer-reviewed ones. Public doesn't know the difference all the time. All this creates the impression that experts can't agree on anything. We might as well make up our own minds. Not to mention that these days, everyone is an expert. At least everyone with a Twitter account or everyone who's a bot. So is what happened during COVID-19 going to happen more generally? We don't know, hopefully not. Most of your work is done quietly and thoughtfully in the back rooms, conferences like this, and that's okay. But I'm not sure that's gonna last. During COVID, what we saw, at least superficially, was a speeding up of the demand for information. Uh, to a certain extent, a democratization of the process. Not always a good one, but. We also got, saw guidelines themselves become meaningless because of all the background noise. The message became muted and twisted by people shooting the messenger. There's no doubt that we live in an era of skepticism and mistrust. This is a hard time to be a scientist. I think it's probably an even harder time to be a guideline writer. We live in a time when expertise is disdained and everyone wants so-called individual treatment choices. Freedom, baby, freedom. 
So to reiterate, clear communication has become essential, but difficult. We have to make it easier to find reliable information for those who want it. And to be frank, that's most people. Let's not give too much weight to the, the extremes. But the information needs to not be only easily accessible, but comprehensible and actionable. That word I'll underline over and over again. That's always my pet peeve. We give people a lot of advice that they can't act on. And in many times, I think we'd better be better off saying nothing. Now, when I was asked to do this talk, I decided to try an exercise. Imagine what it was like if I was one of the many people that I talked to every day in my daily work, a newly diagnosed patient with a condition like breast cancer, and I want to get educated. Find out not just basic information, but I wonder what the best treatment is for me. So naturally, I started at the International Guidelines Library, because the pub, it's all the talk of the public, it's the rage. But uh, in fact, Dr. Google, Google pointed me where? Pointed me to the Mayo Clinic, Canadian Cancer Society. That's not bad. But anyhow, I found your website, with a little help from my friends. When I searched for breast cancer in the guidelines library, I got 37 results. A real mishmash of stuff. Contralateral prophylactic mastectomy is not recommended with early stage unilateral breast cancer, is the first thing that jumped up at me. Didn't really make me want to keep reading, to be honest. But I kept strolling, and then something else caught my eye. Menopause and breast cancer. Oh, that's an interesting topic. So I clicked on it, a publication from the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So that seems credible. But then I ran into a problem, for members only. God forbid that a member of the public read about this topic. They might learn stuff. Now the history buffs among you will know that for the longest time, medical research was only published in Latin. We didn't want the unwashed masses reading medicine and getting ideas and getting uppity. Today we still have a version of Latin Research is written in obtuse, jargonish language. People like me have to translate it for the public. And we don't always do a great job, let's be honest. A lot of it is inside pool. It's not consumer friendly, except for the occasional token plain language summary. So anyhow, back to this exercise of looking for breast cancer info. So I jumped to the US. The US has information on everything. I found the National Guiding Guidelines Clearinghouse, 332 results on breast cancer. And again, a bit of a dog's breakfast of everything. So it, and then I learned that the clearinghouse has been shut down since 2018. So I wasn't sure if these guidelines were still relevant or if this was just a guidelines graveyard. I don't know, maybe it is. A little more web surfing, I realized that the clearinghouse has been replaced by something called the ECRI Guidelines Trust. Well, that sounded fancy. So I clicked on that and I learned that the site is temporarily unavailable. It has been for the last couple of weeks I've tried checking, so. Screw the American advice, I said. It was probably going to be too expensive anyhow. Now, by the way, why do guidelines rarely, if ever, discover, uh, discuss the cost of recommended interventions? Why don't they tell clinicians and consumers what to do if they can't afford a recommended therapy? This is the advice we really want. So back to my Dr. Google. Because I'm an informed consumer, I like to think of myself as one, I remember there's a British group too, NICE. They sound really nice. And they have a guideline section. So I searched breast cancer there. And there were four papers, so that was less daunting. I was happy. And I found that the NICE site was way more user-friendly than the others. The papers were even semi-comprehensible to a layperson. But they're old. One of the guidelines was from 2002. I'm guessing there's been a few advances in breast cancer treatment in the last 20 years, but I'm not sure. And I'm also not sure how guidelines are kept up to date. You know, and then I remembered, I was just reading about a breast cancer breakthrough in the Globe and Mail last week. I wonder if it's in there, that one. Well, I guess it's not in the guidelines from 2002. So what did I learn from this fanciful exercise? That if I'm a patient and I wanna know how my breast cancer is going to be treated, it's gonna be pretty hard to find basic information. But that's okay, I trust my doctor, sort of. But I may get to thinking, what, where does my doctor get her information, by the way, if I can't find it? You know, a lot of people just assume their doctors are all-knowing, especially if they're specialists. Most of the public doesn't give much thought to where physicians get their information from. They don't know that EMRs, electronic medical records, can feature links to guidelines, or that there are go-to recommendations from professional societies, 
or that doctors just have ways of doing things and they never change their, I was going to say fucking minds, but their minds. Increasingly, patients like to do their own homework. They like to have options. Uh, I know a lot of doctors dread it when patients come in with a big pile of printouts to an appointment. But that's not a bad thing. That should be welcomed. For far too long, medical practice has been a one-way process uh, with physicians telling people what they should do and balking at them if they question it. It needs to be more of a conversation, a laying out of options, of discussions of pros and cons, of risks and benefits, of costs, financial and social, of trade-offs in real life. That's why medical information, including guidelines, needs to be more readily available in digestible form. Plain language summaries in medical journals are a start, but we also need plain language summaries of guidelines. We need to know how current they are and if they apply to me and make that easy to figure out. Many consumers groups do a good job of giving patients a sense of what to expect, but they often have vested interests themselves. The hardest thing for a layperson, as I tried to demonstrate with my example a few moments ago, is where do I find credible information that I can act on? It's a cesspool out there in cyberspace. Disinformation is really bad for our health. It's even bad for democracy. But the solution for that is education, equipping people with skills to differentiate, differentiate sense from nonsense. Unfortunately, that's going to take time. But I've already seen some positive change. You know, young people, those who are weaned on the internet, are actually much, much less gullible than us older folk. They're more skeptical and they're more savvy. The biggest spreaders of information, research has showed time and time again, are baby boomers. Baby boomers are to blame for everything. We would all do ourselves a great favor if we just hesitated a moment and considered the credibility of information before posting it on Facebook, which is also something only boomers use. Anyhow, I realize I've been a bit all over the map and I'm almost out of time, so let me reiterate. The important message I want to convey this morning is this. You're doing important work, but it's getting harder. Guidelines have to adapt to the times. I think your biggest challenge going forward is speed. People are impatient. The pace of change is dizzying. And keeping up with developments and updating guidelines is going to be challenging, way more challenging than it's been. Impossible at times. There's going to be a role for AI here, but also unprecedented challenges. Like, how do you offer guidance in the era of personalized medicine? I particularly appreciate the work you've been doing and the discussion you've been having here this week about equity and transparency. We don't talk about those things enough. It's really refreshing, too, that you care about the knowledge translation piece, about making uh, guidelines more accessible and useful to the public. Data visualization, single-page summaries, plain language, these things are essential, not just for patients, but for clinicians and policy makers too. They don't have any more time than the rest of us. Making recommendations easy to understand doesn't mean dumbing them down. The public is far more sophisticated than we give them credit for. And that's doubly true of patients uh, who've taken interest in their personal condition and the nitty gritty of their care. Get patients on guideline committees. They have a lot to offer. And also, if everybody else is getting paid at the table, pay them. Don't take advantage of them. As I said earlier, the future of medicine is about conversation and collaboration, and patients and their family have to be key collaborators. I want to finish by thanking you for taking a risk, for reaching out to a layperson like you who made a bunch of snarky comments at the podium. I hope I've, if nothing else, given you some food for thought on a topic you've been mulling over for days, the changing role of guidelines in the post-pandemic world. After all, a once-in-a-century pandemic would be a terrible, terrible thing to waste. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oops, I forgot the microphone. Thanks, thanks very much, Andre. That was brilliant, albeit rather sobering, I have to say. We've got time for just one question, I think. So does anybody uh, like to ask anything? Ah, oh, yeah, great. Yes, thank you so much for this um, fantastic and also challenging view that you had on the guidelines. I have one question as you're an expert in communication and the most important issue we as guideline developers have to deal with is uncertainty. What is your recommendation how to communicate uncertainty? Yeah, so I think, you know, people are not afraid of uncertainty. People are, 
are really actually comfortable. This is, I speak to many medical school students, and I always say this. Uh, when you say, I don't know, that doesn't bother people. What bothers people is false uh, confidence, uh, getting things wrong. People like it when, you, you know, one of the most comforting things is, I, I don't know, but here's what I know. Here's the, what we know based on the evidence at the time. That's the language piece I was talking about is really, really crucial. And we didn't do enough of that in COVID. We didn't uh, prep people for the fact that things are going to change. We knew that, you know, the people were talking about vaccines like they were just going to cure people magically. We'd get one shot and the pandemic was going to be over. Nobody believed that who had any a scintilla of scientific knowledge. So we should have, we have to really prime the pump. You have to tell people, this is what we know. So I'm telling you today, it may change tomorrow, but this is the best we can do. And that, that is actually comforting. It's not a bad thing. Uh, you know, I, I write a lot about risk communication. How do you talk about uh, things like hurricanes and earthquakes? And it's the same thing. People don't want false hope. They want sensible advice and the best case or the most likely scenarios, not the best or worst case scenarios. Thanks. Thanks very much. And we'll come back hopefully to some more questions during the panel discussion. Holger. Take this over from you. Um, thanks so much um, for this inspiring talk. I'm very, and I'm sure we will have follow-up um, on some of these items at the end of this, um, um, of the, at the end of the last talk or after the last talk. I'm now extremely pleased to introduce um, 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 Dr. Ezio Tavora. Um, I met Ezio a few years ago at a guideline panel. Um, at WHO working on tuberculosis guidelines and I thought um, if I ever have to organize a conference I want Ezio to come and talk to us. Um, Ezio holds a degree, it's actually three degrees. Um, he's a lawyer, he has a degree in international relations and a degree in health policy yet is a um, great advocate for the, con the, the public voice so it's really extremely pleased to have you here and um, listen to you. Thank you, Holger. Uh, uh, first time, uh, first time in, in a GEN conference and I was really surprised to see how much uh, work is being done uh, with the inclusions of communities. As an advocate, uh, um, I think my, my role was to, to bring a perspective and I think that was the the invitation by Holger, um, who has been a great supporter of the community participation in, in guideline development at the WHO. Well, I'm an old uh, advocate. Uh, I started actually uh, doing advocacy when I got, I got my diagnosis of HIV in the beginning of the epidemic into, uh, when I was 21 years old at the second year of law school. And then I, I joined uh, the AIDS advocacy and we, 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 we actually transformed the scenario of, of the AIDS response. So I think uh, that what, uh, what make uh, advo advocates really um, um, engaged and uh, has, has such an ownership of, of, of work. And all we have been speak, uh, uh, talking here these days is uh, trust. I think the transparency is, is uh, an equity depends on trust. I, and the, the inspiring presentation that we just had uh, just shows that. I think we, um, oh, if, if, if the guidelines are not good for uh, practitioners, for, for the programs, and especially for those users, it's good for nothing. I'm sorry to, to say that because we, we, we tend uh, to improve the technicalities, but we often forget how this reaches the, the people who are going to use the guidelines. So it is critical to have the community engagement all the way down. Um, uh, I should move like here. Yeah, so um, I, I, although I don't have any conflict of interest, I'm a completely biased. Uh, I come from the community, so I mean, uh, regardless to say, so I, I'm a member of the uh, uh, WHO CSTF, but I, um, and I um, uh, have been uh, in the technical advisory committee of the Brazilian NTP, so I have been member of, of uh, many um, uh, national and global guidelines. So the outline is just about the context in the community's uh, participation, a short survey. I wanted to fish 
something to bring uh, you from the community participation in, uh, in different guidelines and some conclusions. So uh, what, which communities are we talking about? I mean, I have been hearing here in the last four days about, about that, and, and I'm very pleased to, to hear the change in the language, the, 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 the attention, and, and uh, being in Canada is, 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 is a great privilege because the Brazilian Unified Health System was very much inspired in, at the um, uh, NHS in Britain, and in the Canadian universal access system. So we, we use the word users because are the users of the services, the users of, and we don't call patient, we don't say patients, we don't, because patient is a, a relation between the, uh, the medical doctor and, and the patient uh, and, and at, at that point. Otherwise, we are talking about people affected and, and citizens like we, we, we are. Uh, last month I was in Geneva and we we spent like two days just talking about communities because uh, people, uh, representatives from governments and, and, and researchers feel difficulty to talk, uh, to understand that we are talking about basically communities affected and their representatives. Um, we work with uh, grassroots community-based organizations and networks of people and organizations. So basically we are talking about advocates providing input into policy. The TB scenario, when I started doing work, I started from scratch uh, in 2002, 20, exactly 20 years ago, um, uh, uh, was, uh, was a no uh, community mobilization, but the TB scenario was uh, an old one. It's a disease of poverty, highly medicalized, so the, the uh, uh, medical approach. So the, the, the question about the environment and ethiological agent <clears throat> is a big question. I mean, look at uh, Northern America and uh, Western Europe. Why TB disappeared? Because the quality of life improved. I mean, uh, uh, better nourishment, uh, better housing, and then TB disappeared. So where is TB in North America and Western Europe is in where poverty is. Um, so, I mean, this is as simple as that. So the, the, the aspect of the etiological agent is, uh, is, is, is a medical issue, it's, uh, but it's not for the people. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, again, the lack of participation and input uh, in demand uh, uh, created a, a very uh, delay in, in TB. No? So there, there was that, that, uh, uh, that approach led to uh, uh, controversial policies like DOTS and non-DOTS, me, from coming from HIV and AIDS, we were shocked to see tuberculosis talking about seeing a healthcare person uh, uh, not trusting the patient and having to see them swallowing the pill, because I, which means like, I don't trust you, so you have to do that in front of me. Otherwise, I don't trust you. So it's an untrust uh, 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 thing, and that's what has been used. Uh, so it's re really controversial, and we from HIV and AIDS having far more complex uh, therapies, uh, we didn't have that. So um, um, we, we, um, we have a very uh, a slow development uh, of products uh, in TB, exactly because of the low uh, uh, participation of communities. So, but in the last 20 years, we did a little revolution. So there has been an incredible increase in community participation in research and development, because this is my focus. I decided as an old advocate to focus uh, the, the strength of, of advocacy, empowering communities to follow up research and being in the discussion of, of, of policies, which means guidelines for them to be empowered to discuss that. In, and and uh, that's, that's basically done uh, due to a, a, a huge policy transfer from the HIV and ex experience into, into TB. Um, there was, in the 90s, a clear strategy that we advocates, we use it, which was like we, we had to get into, uh, because the, the response in HIV and AIDS was community-based. So the governments and researchers, we all learned together with, uh, with uh, physicians, etc. But And we changed the scenario, but we needed more uh, technical expertise. So the, the, many advocates jumped from, from advocacy into uh, academic 
academical work and to tr try to learn and to improve tec uh, te uh, tec uh, technicalities in, in the way we, we, we do. So there was a timid but relevant transition uh, from uh, health advocates and, and uh, uh, people uh, uh, learned uh, uh, a lot from the HIV and ex experience, especially the advocacy focusing on uh, research development and guideline uh, definition. So um, this, uh, this has increased a lot of the, the uh, by means of the community advisory boards. That's basically the work that I have been doing the last many years, creating a community advisory board uh, specific to some studies or, or, or big ones, and uh, the engagement of communities in ethics committees and in policy discussion to develop guidelines. So we have been um, uh, having a, 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 pro, a clear project, uh, progress in terms of uh, uh, acknowledgement of, of the contribution of communities. I mean, a few years ago, it was not uh, the case. I remember like in 2010, I started a, a, a study down in Brazil and the researchers asked me, like, why did you brought these advocates here? They hardly speak a good Portuguese, so are they uh, intending to tell me what, how, to, how to do things? Because the advocates were telling the, 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 the researchers that the way they were, were uh, uh, trying to, to, to uh, to, uh, um, uh, to have the, 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 the trial participants would not work because the health units didn't talk to each other and they don't, don't refer well to each other. So the, the, the communities know that, but the researchers and sometimes even the healthcare workers don't know that. So, um, and this changed completely. This scenario has changed really f uh, fast because of, of, of the work. We have been seeing also improvement in the language of protocols and the guidelines as well, and uh, we have been really having a, a, a people-centered approach. I have to, to, to acknowledge particularly the, the change in, in WHO, particularly because we have been seeing changes in, 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 in various levels, but clearly in this administration since 2017, there was a huge effort from, from WHO to increase the participation of communities, and this has been uh, uh, really uh, crucial. And in tuberculosis, probably we had the greatest advance, particularly having the uh, uh, civil society task force participate in that. So uh, we have um, uh, the, the, the challenges is exactly the level of scientific knowledge, uh, the, the diversity of backgrounds, the language barriers, because when uh, I heard also uh, uh, in these days, people saying like, uh, and, and what uh, actually Holger asked this like uh, about the accuracy of, of, of the translation of the guideline and the interpretation on, 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 on different languages. Uh, but this is, uh, people, people really care for that, and I think that uh, this is something that we, we sometimes cannot control, but, uh, but the language barriers happens in, 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 in all aspects, and also the, co uh, the cultural. And the embarrassment uh, expressed by uh, some advocates, um, and the lack of support, because basically the advocates do a, a volunteer-based work. So uh, the challenges are, are frequently the disparities between the epi and cli uh, clinical to human and social and economical studies. Uh, sometimes we see uh, huge studies bringing very little evidence from, from uh, the, the qualitative area, and this make all, also the decision, the guideline development weaker, I think. We have seen that in, in many times <laughs> we, we, we um, we saw many, uh, uh, many studies with, with uh, over 1,000 participants, and, and sometimes we have a, a qualitative evidence from one person in, in a different country. That doesn't work. We have to improve on that. We have to, to, to make sure that, that studies are carried with uh, uh, community participation and the uh, uh, qualitative uh, uh, information comes through. And um, a certain disregard of the importance of, of the qualitative data, uh, data is a fact still. So uh, we have been a, a, a huge improvement, as I said, uh, uh, um, uh, in the uh, guideline development groups uh, uh, and expert consultations at WHO level, but also in different levels. And um, 
we had a, 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 a huge incru, increase of, of civil society and participants of, of, of the GDGs. And the recommendation for, for the inclusion of uh, 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 civil society representatives at country and policy level. So here just a list of some of the, the participation in the last WHOTB TB guidelines. So it's really huge and there are some ongoing which are not in this list. And I did, uh, I fished some information from my colleagues. Uh, so I did a, a, a really quick uh, uh, survey monkey uh, with my colleagues who have been working on, um, 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 from the community side in, in guideline development. So I assessed 58 people um, and I did two parallel uh, uh, surveys in Portuguese and English, identical, and this was run this month. So I did it really quickly. So I just wanted to share that mostly are, are, are women, uh, are people between uh, 30 and 60 years old, mostly uh, the most of the uh, respondents were from Brazil, India, and South Africa, but we had people from Moldova, uh, Kenya, Georgia, uh, Mexico, uh, Peru, uh, Uganda. Uh, so we have a series of, of, of countries. So most of these people who I assessed were participants in uh, community participant, uh, participants in guidelines, but they mostly come from community-based organizations and particularly from uh, uh, community advisory boards. <clears throat> and some of those respondents were also research members but link it to the, 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 the community. So um, um, this is just, a, 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 I wanted to do this because I, I want to use this information also for, for, the, for, for Brazil, like uh, if, you, uh, how, uh, uh, if, if they have been participated, a majority of the people uh, are from community advisory boards, which is extremely important. And uh, there, is, there was a little difference. I wanted to check that, uh, but I was happy to see that there were, between uh, uh, Brazil and international response was uh, very similar. Um, but, uh, but I was surprised to see that most of the participation was on subnational and national uh, 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 guidelines. And I was very happy with this response. This was, for me, very significant. And also, uh, the majority of the areas is, uh, is on treatment and prevention, as, as, I, uh, as we could uh, 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 foresee, but also vaccines and other, and also in, clean, in, 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 in scientific area. Um, but, uh, so, uh, the status in the group, uh, uh, so the, most of people haven't answered, because, and, and most people responded uh, uh, with more than one uh, 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 a point, but basically they were uh, community advocates, um, NGO members, um, so the, the greatest part of uh, 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 community-based people. And, uh, and, and, and when I ask it then about their research uh, literacy, um, uh, then, then it's an interesting thing, because they most don't know how to respond to that. Because and 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 uh, most uh, decide that uh, understand that they have a medium expertise, but most don't don't uh, don't know actually how to respond to this question. And if they have uh, 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 received uh, capacity building to participate in guidelines uh, development, uh, uh, most have said yes, but almost the same quantity done, didn't respond to that, which is also important. So, but, but by, from, from those who, who, who participated, um, uh, uh, people acknowledge that the, 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 the training helped understanding the community dynamics, um, uh, the components of the guidelines, and it was giving a, 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 a research, and, a, a research information and helping understanding the process and made me speak with confidence to communities on clinical trials and vaccine development. So this is super important. Um, and um, so this is, uh, was a, a big response, but uh, I, I found fantastic that one, one respondent said that uh, although he, has, uh, uh, he or she uh, hasn't uh, received the training, they went through and, and went through the good uh, clinical practices. So, um, uh, but, uh, but people who didn't receive, they, they responded that they were not feeling capable like the others. 
uh, and uh, uh, so they, they feel like a, a missing uh, support to, to interpret. And uh, another surprising response that is that because majority of, I hear a lot of complaint, probably Hoga d does that well, uh, that most of people don't uh, think that they spend too much time uh, in, in guideline uh, 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 development. But the majority said that uh, it's actually a reasonable time, and, but also the, almost the same number of people didn't respond, which is also important to, to see. Same here. Um, uh, I like this, this slide because the half of people say that they felt comfortable um, participating in the guidelines. This, I think, one of the most important questions for me. But the half of people did not respond, almost. And a, li a little people said that it was really uncomfortable or unpleasant to participate in guideline development. And um, most of people said that they felt privileged to be part in the group, um, uh, and it was a very good uh, uh, and capacitating, but, uh, but some people felt that they were ignored, uh, although some said that they were proud, privileged, lucky, enraged, disappointed, happy, unhappy. It's a long and winding process. And it's, uh, somebody said that it's an intimidating experience, especially depending on, on the tone and style of the GDG chair. But it's incredibly valuable to see how research is translated to policy at the global and national level, especially um, in, uh, by informing research design. So uh, the overall perspective, um, uh, so it is uh, uh, people, people uh, think of, of, of the, uh, the um, uh, the, the importance of how they perceive their contribution, although half also hasn't responded, and this is also significant. The same here, the perception by the others, the same like uh, most perceive that uh, uh, other, uh, other stakeholders understand their participation as meaningful, but um, uh, also almost uh, the half as, as says uh, uh, they don't know how the other stakeholders perceive them. And, um, uh, but, uh, so how do you understand the community engagement contributes? So it, it, it's, it is, uh, for me, this phrase is really brilliant. It's very key because the community is the end user of the guideline, and it brings a life experience into the process and the urgency that we need, particularly in tuberculosis. So um, uh, the, the most important uh, thing is that the guidelines uh, don't stop there because uh, the advocates are so crucial, because not only for the development of the guidelines, but the most importantly, the application of the guidelines. So they all feel like they, they, they envision their role after, uh, with the guideline implementation. And guidelines sh uh, should uh, be translated to allow uh, uh, the lay workers to read and teach communities, cab members to, to be involved before the study is rolled out, uh, out of the community. And um, uh, some, some advocate uh, uh, talking about the, the need of government support and understanding. So in conclusion, I think the, the, the community advisory boards or community advisory groups are an important source of qualified uh, uh, guideline members. Uh, there is a huge willingness of communities uh, uh, to be uh, participating in research and, and, and development and guidelines development. Uh, and, and, and there is a perception of usefulness and legitimacy by community members and a recognition that we now have, although there is still a lot of information missing. Um, uh, by other stakeholders. So uh, education or capacity building is absolutely key. We, I have been hearing this in the last days, but, um, uh, um, but uh, again, important to highlight the, the importance of the communities in, in guideline development, but also in policy implementation. So definitely investment in supporting community engagement reflects directly on transparent, uh, equitable, and efficient guideline development. So uh, investing, investment in community is crucial. So uh, thanks uh, for my, my uh, uh, colleagues at the Brazilian TB Research Network and to the Brazilian uh, National TB Cab, the, the Simplice TB Cab, the Stream sites, the TB Alliance sites the WHO Global TB Program for the help and guidance, and the C my colleagues at the CSTF, the Global TB Cab, and the Treatment Action Group. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ezio, so much for that. Um, it's been incredible progress um, that um, you've contributed to in engaging people in, in the actual development of guidelines, but also in the research that actually takes place. And, and uh, I have huge admiration for the type of advocacy that you, that you represent, because advocacy is a difficult, um, difficult topic. So mm -hmm. thanks so much for that. I wonder if there are any questions mm -hmm. for you. Otherwise, I'll, okay, there's a question from the floor. I have a burning one, but. Uh. Sorry, Holger. Thank you, though. Thank you for the talk. Um, John Hill from IDSA. I liked the uh, point and the conclusion about education and capacity building being a key point. When I think about that, I look at the volume of education and capacity building that seems like it's necessary. So I wonder if you have suggestions on what are the most important places to start with education and capacity building so that we can begin to bring patients onto our panels. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, the response for that is what I have been focusing in the last years. I think that uh, when, I, when, I, when I saw the, the, the AIDS movement uh, like decaying in a certain way in the quality of the, the, the work they were doing, I said like the way to strengthen that was to educate people around science uh, about uh, about research so when we create the community advisory boards when we cre create co community advisory group we have a selected a number of people who are interested in, in understanding the research and also also uh, to to disseminate the results and to uh, and to discuss the implementation of those guidelines creation of guidelines and, and and implementation of that because we we cannot go everywhere we have to focus somewhere we have to have a strategy to fund and uh, what I have been doing in the last many years is exactly to focus on community advisory groups and community advisory boards because the, the response is really important. All these 58 people that I assessed in this uh, short survey uh, 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 are members from uh, we, you saw from different countries and I was very pleased also with the South African and, um, and um, the Indian participation, but we have seen from all over the world, but they are all most of, uh, participants of community advisory boards uh, throughout the world. So this is the strategy. Uh, that's where we should uh, focus and support and make sure that every clinical trial, but e even s basic science, should have a community advisory board. This is a requirement in HIV and AIDS. The donors require that the, there are uh, community advisory boards around uh, uh, clinical trials in HIV and AIDS, but it's not a requirement for most of the other areas. And this should be a, a thing, the investment in that. Community people work for free. I mean, but the, the, the time that they have to dedicate is huge. So there must be an understanding and discussion on how can we better support and how can we compensate um, the, the work they do. And it, we should never expect that people will come into the room and have the same language. This is an educational process. It takes a long while, but it's, it really is very worthy. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the final speaker of this session, but also the final presenter of the conference. Nancy Santesso is Associate Professor at McMaster University and Deputy Director of Cochrane Canada, and extremely well placed to build on the theme that we have of communicating evidence to the public and to okay. patients. Great. Nancy. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have to admit that after I heard the presentation from Andre, I was also a little depressed. Because um, I thought, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? How can we do this? Um, Ezio, you've, you've, also, you've made it a, a good point that actually we're doing something and uh, the next step also, uh, one solution is to actually involve the um, people who are living with those experiences and we can do that. Um, so there's a solution. And I'm hoping that through my presentation, we actually have a, hopefully at the end, uh, you'll see that we, we in our little offices can also do something and um, we could be successful. Okay, good. Um, so a bit more introduction to myself. Um, I'm, uh, I live in Niagara Falls, have lived there for quite a long time. And um, this is just a picture in the winter time of Niagara Falls. You won't see it like this for uh, probably a few more months. 
Um, and uh, just this past winter, after our long lockdowns and everything, uh, we had another uh, reason that we were trapped in our houses. Um, they were expecting a lot of snow. And I don't know if you can see, my car is almost halfway buried there. Um, and lots of big piles of snow. Um, and we were indeed, I was, we were trapped in our house for two days because we had to wait for the snow plows to come. Um, and, and then I'll just say, the mayor lives down our street. So we actually thought that the snow would be removed first from our house. It was, it was the last, we think it was the last place that was actually plowed. Anyway, um, the, about two days before that, we had a lot of uh, forecasts, obviously, from the weather network about uh, what was coming, um, what to do, what to prepare for. And I was listening and watching the, the clip, and then all of a sudden, this comes up. And I was super amazed. I was so impressed. Um, and just if, just if you can see it, um, and I hadn't seen this before, at least for the weather network, actually. Um, they had high confidence that snow was coming. They knew it was going to be snow. Um, they also had high confidence of when it was going to come, two days, it was coming in two days. Um, but they had moderate or medium confidence about how much was coming and where it was going to be. Um, and in fact, for our, in Niagara Falls, they only predicted, they thought it was going to be about 20 to 30 centimeters, and in fact, it was three to four times that amount. So they were, I might have said that should have been low certainty for me. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, but this was pretty amazing, and I thought, you know, this is something that they're uh, delivering to the public. It's super transparent, um, and, you know, this is what we're sort of doing, and I thought, that's really great. Um, did they make a recommendation? Actually, no. They just presented the evidence, um, and uh, although people did take away from that, they came up with their own recommendation, which was a strong recommendation to stock up on essentials. <laughs> And I will show you a picture, and this is not from COVID times. This was the day before the storm came. Empty bread shelves, uh, which was pretty amazing. Um, but a bit of a joke, um, you know, whether we, we have certainty of evidence, we have the effects that are probably possibly happening, um, maybe some recommendations. Um, and this really does apply to what we're doing here in, in the Guidelines International Network. Um, the, the kind of the question for us is, um, you know, they presented this high, medium levels. Um, you could be using the grade system and, and it's high, moderate, low, and very low certainty. You can use other systems, but how are people actually interpreting these messages and do they interpret them well? Um, do we, should we communicate these messages? Many of you have probably been on a guideline panel or facilitating or involved in some way where they've said, you know, we don't want to tell people that we have low certainty evidence or low certainty in this evidence or very low certainty in this evidence. Should we actually be communicating this information all, uh, to the public, to physicians um, at all? So that's a, that's a bigger question. Um, we do have a bit of research, a while back, I was working on a project with the Decide Project through GRADE um, back 2014, a few years ago. We, had, we did a systematic review of how people were perceiving guidelines and their, public at, their attitudes towards them. Um, there wasn't a lot of literature at that time. We've definitely increased the amount of literature we have right now. Um, at the time, there were only two studies. Um, but the general feeling from the, the patients and the public and from those studies was that um, it wasn't really clear whether guidelines were based on evidence, so that was, that was a bit um, not so good. Um, but they did prefer, they wanted to know about that uncertainty related to outcomes of a treatment or a test. They wanted to know that. So we had a bit of information. Um, and since those times, we've been doing a lot more research. I, I'll just highlight some of the studies that we've uh, been involved in, but obviously a whole literature around that. Um, we did some research with a consumer audience, qualitative studies. Uh, we did um, also some randomized control trial, testing the, the formats and how we could communicate that evidence to people. 
Um, and we also did some work where it wasn't just patients and consumers, it was also with uh, healthcare professionals too, um, trying to, to determine how they're interpreting that certainty of evidence. Bottom line across these audiences, um, Generally, people do think of it as just a cer they're certain or they're less certain. Um, maybe not all the levels that we're, we've um, presented to them through uh, different systems. Um, when we did the work with the patients and uh, the public, um, they said, you know, how they perceived that researchers were being wishy-washy when it was low certainty, um, that they didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and uh, if it was moderate certainty, they perceived it as uh, being a bit more confident. And I guess this is a little bit negative, you know, maybe those comments are a little bit negative towards researchers, but in general, I think this is a pretty good interpretation of certainty of evidence, which is, you know, people, they, as Andre said, they want to know about it, and it's probably not a bad thing to be communicating this to, um, to the public and to healthcare professionals, etc. Um, seeming to understand it, but what about recommendations? Um, so what do we know about how people are interpreting recommendations? If you use the GRADE approach, um, it's divided into two types of recommendations. So it's a strong recommendation, where you would recommend an action. Most healthcare professionals would do it. Um, most patients would want it, so that's your strong recommendation. Um, a conditional or weak recommendation, we would suggest doing something. Um, the majority of healthcare professionals would do, should do it. Most uh, majority of patients would want it, um, but obviously there's more discussion. So we we try to determine how are um, patients, healthcare professionals, interpreting strong and or conditional recommendations. And there's quite a bit of literature on this and um, already published. I'm going to build on what's coming out of those, that came out of those studies. Um, many from the people that are in this audience, um, or if they're still here, um, and also some work that we did and present in the Gin Public Toolkit specifically for the public. Um, but I'll also speak about two, two studies. We, we did some focus groups where we came up with plain language recommendations, um, and then also something not yet published about how um, clinicians in pediatric oncology are interpreting strong and weak uh, recommendations. So the interesting thing is there are, again, consistent findings even across these different audiences. Um, strong recommendations seem to be well understood. You know, this is something I need, I'm, I have to do, I'm what to do. Um, but more work seems to be needed with the conditional recommendations. Um, although it was perceived quite well, I think conditional recommendations sound a little bit half-hearted. Well, yeah, we're not sure about those ones. Um, they require more decision-making, absolutely. Um, both audience wanted to know, though, why a recommendation might be conditional. They wanted to know that rationale, um, and that's pretty key, and I think that's what we've been trying to focus on, is the why, and trying to communicate that and the rationale. And that's what we did in this work with the pediatric oncologists. Um, you know, we had the recommendations listed at the top, we gave them a brief summary of the supporting evidence, but you can see a lot of property given to the rationale of why we made that recommendation. And it turned out that that actually helped people understand, those healthcare professionals, to understand that recommendation and why, why we were maybe a little wishy-washy and not really sure about what we had recommended. So good news. The bad news is there's that rationale section. Um, we've had, and the question is, can we always provide that information when we're communicating those recommendations? Um, provide the why. And again, this goes back to what Andre, his, the title of his um, presentation about, you know, and why are we doing something? Um, the challenge that we had with the pediatric oncology guidelines were, um, they had, it was based on guidelines from a few years ago that they had developed. They were just starting to use GRADE, um, and uh, we used those to come up with a template of how to communicate the recommendations. Um, unfortunately, though, those guidelines didn't include all of the information about the why. 
And that happens often, actually, and I'll, I'll jump to that in a second. Um, but that's what happened with that one. We, other experiences that we've had, we've uh, worked with the American Society of Hematology, developing a whole series of recommendations. Uh, one of the things that I worked on with the uh, other uh, researchers and consumers was creating patient versions for some of those uh, recommendations and guidelines. Um, the lucky thing about that one, which was actually the good point, was these guidelines were based and they used evidence to decision tables. So we had tons and tons of information in the back to be able to come up with the why, the transparency there. Um, very, very transparent. Not the first thing when you go into the guideline, but all of those tables behind it were available. Um, we could see what did the guideline group consider when they made their recommendations? They looked at benefits and harms, patient values. They did talk about equity, costs and resources, acceptability, feasibility, all available in those tables. Um, we saw how they considered it. And we saw what were the judgments that they made and why they made those judgments. Very, very transparent. We saw for example, I'll just highlight, for benefits and harms, what was the evidence that they found? Well, it was randomized controlled trials. Sometimes it was just systematic observations from the guideline panel. Um, how certain were we in that evidence? This information was available, and we could communicate that when we put together those patient versions. Um, did they look at equity? Yes. Did they find that effects were changed in limited resource settings or in key populations? That information was available in those evidence to decision tables. So super transparent. Unfortunately, and I think we, uh, Tamara discussed this yesterday, um, we have a whole database full of recommendations and guidelines for covering COVID, um, and a large number of recommendations and guidelines. And they have gone through them, and I think we already saw a little bit about this. They went through the, the recommendations and they've assessed them using the AGREE tool. Um, you see the last two ones at the side there, rigor and clarity of presentation. Um, if some of you know, maybe some of you know the agreed tool off by heart, um, but those are the two categories where you would see if you, are tables available? How was the evidence used to come up with recommendations? Was it clear? Um, unfortunately, a little, ha a little over half of the recommendations um, scored, you know, good. Uh, over 60% on those that rigor. Um, very small percentage uh, scored well for clarity of presentation. So unfortunately, we, uh, many recommendations and guidelines are not transparent, and that will make it difficult for us to be able to use them to then translate and um, provide that information to uh, public, patients, um, policymakers, um, and healthcare professionals. Um, so the challenge is we may want to provide that why uh, to certain target audiences, but unfortunately many, many, many may not be transparent. Um, who else? So I covered patients and uh, pu um, public uh, professionals I've covered, um, but who else might need the why? Um, well, likely other guideline developers, and we've heard quite a bit uh, in some of our sessions about those who are adapting or adoloping some of those recommendations. Um, we had conducted a, had a project with Trinidad and Tobago through PAHO um, to support them to make some recommendations um, related to antibiotic prescriptions and the upper respiratory tract symptoms. Um, we used the great adolement approach. Um, the best thing that happened to us was we found a nice guideline, and I'm not just saying a nice guideline, but it was a guideline from NICE, and they had all of the tables in the back. We could see all of the evidence that they used. Um, we could see all of the judgments, why they made their recommendations, and by using that, we were able to say, okay, does this information, is it relevant to Trinidad and Tobago setting? Is there other information that we might need that might be relevant, more relevant to, to Trinidad and Tobago? 
what drugs are available in that country. Um, and then we were actually, then we looked at the judgments that NICE had made, and we said, are those judgments, do we agree with those judgments? So we went through everything, and then that's how we came up with our recommendation. But the only way that we could do that was because it was very transparent, we had lots of tables in behind, and we could see the why. Um, so I've covered the different audiences that potentially could use these guidelines, um, patients in the public, healthcare professionals, other guideline developers. We have a whole other list of uh, different populations we could target as well. What seems to be consistent across those audiences is they want to know the why, the rationale. Um, one of the barriers to that is possibly that our guidelines are not transparent. Um, and I would suggest, and to hopefully be um, a bit on the positive side, um, where we're in our offices, one of the key goals, and I think many of us are already doing this, is one of our goals should really be to help support groups to make their decisions as transparent as they can be, put those out there, and hopefully that can be picked up by um, journalists, um, other guideline developers, patients, the public, and healthcare professionals. Um, and so, thank you very much. Brilliant, thanks, Nancy. Any specific questions or for clarification to Nancy before we have a panel discussion? No, nope. okay. nope, it looks like so. So if you want to join the panel, I'll, I'll kick off and then I'll hand over to, to Holger. Uh, anybody like to start with a question for the panel? Is that somebody going to the microphone or somebody going to that? No. Nope. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question, which is that we talk about patients and the public or citizens, don't we? And we talk about them as though it's one group. But in fact, there's a whole range of levels of knowledge, understanding and interest in that big group group. I spent a year as a general practitioner in a deprived bit of Scotland and my main skill was not what I'd learnt at medical school, it was titrating my communication skills depending on who came through the door. Some people I had to do some pretty basic drawings to explain what was going on. So I get the impression when we talk about communicating to the public, we're really talking about communicating to relatively informed and interested people and is that good enough is my question. So I don't know who'd like to start. Andre, why don't you start? Yeah, so I, I often, uh, I say information has to be presented sort of like an onion. Some people just want the outside. Some want to go a little deeper and some want to really cry. They want to get right to the core there. <laughs> so that, I think it has to be available in different levels. Just because, uh, as I said, there's no population anymore. There's populations and there's, you really have to target your messaging. So for a lot, of, a lot of the public, just that outer layer, that's fine. This is what I want to know, and some people need to really know, dig down. Uh, I would like to, to add a uh, recent experience that we are just finishing now. Um, we, 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 we are finishing the stream uh, trial, which is the longest MDR trial in, in tuberculosis. We've uh, had like a uh, thousand uh, participants in, in two stages. It's uh, lasted like uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, practically, and on, um, we, we did a dissemination on, on, of, of the stage one, and we, we understood um, how much information was not needed from different publics. So we did an assessment of how people were understanding the res study results and, uh, and how they found them and, and, and understanding. So the, for the stage two, we prepared, uh, we, we did a great job um, on, um, on dissemination and we, we followed the uh, good participatory practices by the book. We did exactly what is recommended. It's a, 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 a good participatory practice of, uh, for communities and in research. And one of the recommendations is, is to first inform the trial participants, which is something that normally people forget to do. 
and to inform the, the, the community. So you have, uh, and then, obvi uh, and this obviously the researchers will, will participate in that, but also the, the, the communities. Before the study is announced, so we had done this work, I mean in 13 sites in seven different countries, beautiful work that we have done and incredible uh, 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 feedback. Um, and we, it, it takes a lot of work, but, it, uh, but we understood that we have to develop information um, in, in, in different uh, levels because that's different information that people need. So we have to have, the, uh, it, it's a hell of a work, but we, we had to develop uh, like materials in uh, three kinds of materials. But it was the right thing to do. The feedback was fantastic. I was so proud because I have done, I was involved in so many studies in, in HIV and AIDS and in, in tuberculosis and never saw something like that. I was very proud to be participating in that. I'll, and and the, uh, a question was about, uh, from the researchers like how we are going to disseminate uh, among the, the trial participants and CAB members and the, the information of the results uh, before the results are, uh, uh, go public. Uh, we have done that in 13 sites in seven countries and it did not go out of the, the people involved in the study. We obviously informed WHO already in May and we, we are adapting the, the, the results. It will be announced uh, probably next month. Uh, but uh, this is a, a, good, a good example of how do we, we have to address the information, how we provide information, and how we make, uh, and then they understood the importance of that study. And, and so uh, that's uh, when, when, because every time I hear from, from, from the, 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 the frontline healthcare workers, and sometimes from program managers, that they are absolutely overwhelmed with the information of, that they receive from WHO, and from, and from the NTP, or from other, because it's so much, I mean, and I heard here all these days in this conference, like, people here know that, that uh, the, the physicians don't have time to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ezio. Um, Robert? Thank you. Um, I have, um, uh, well, thanks, uh, first of all, to, to all three speakers for uh, really good presentations. Um, I have a question that goes slightly beyond the, the um, topic of this um, plenary, um, but I think uh, it's probably something that uh, other people experienced as well, and that is to do with COVID and uh, people sort of mistrusting science and science communication and going for alternative sources of, of um, uh, information. And uh, well, the personal example that I have is that um, uh, a couple that have been around for all my life um, basically disregarded all the evidence and basically rejected outright to have a vaccination because they, quote, didn't want to be guinea pigs. And uh, um, when I carefully, obviously I didn't want to shatter that relationship that I had for so many years, explored it, it, it went down to the level of, um, um, yeah, um, the, the first news coming out of China is that they built a hospital in two weeks and even in China that's not possible and therefore I mistrusted everything that was said uh, about COVID afterwards. It was that sort of level. Um, my question is, uh, probably to all of you, how do you deal with that and uh, how can we reach um, these sort of populations that are so disengaged from normal, fairly accepted, evidence-based, science-based uh, uh, information? No, I don't, I won't answer that. <laughs> I, I think he, he brought the answer uh, when, in, when he spoke. I mean, the, 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 the thing is like uh, the, the communication, I mean, I saw in my country, it is amazing what uh, with this anti-vax uh, 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 propaganda that we have been seeing. I mean, polio is coming back. Who would ever say that, that polio is coming back because people are not vaccinating the children? Uh, BC, we will see children dying of, 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 of meningitis, TB meningitis, because they don't have, receive BCG. It's ridiculous. We are going backwards. We are going through uh, uh, back to because of the, the, the propaganda of some politicians. And, and that has to do with beliefs and uh, how, how people perceive things. So, so that's a completely um, uh, um, uh, the, the, the responses uh, uh, that we have to, to keep uh, bringing information, I mean, the information is key because we cannot fight against the propaganda, especially from uh, politicians. I mean, look at my country, it's a, it's a nightmare. I mean, living with Bolsonaro is a, 
living nightmare because the guy every every day he was uh, how to, uh, 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 contradicting what the Ministry of Health was saying and doing, what the researchers were doing. I mean, we came to, into a, a situation that the, the 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 journalists decide to get the information, the 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 the, the COVID information from the, the states and, the mun uh, and municipalities to have a trustful information. Can you believe that? Because he destroyed the, uh, the, 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 the ministry, the, the structure of the ministry and the propaganda. I mean, coming, confusing people and, and making a big mess. It, 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 so, uh, yeah. In follow up to that, Ezra, I think there's a, I was wondering um, if Andre um, wants to comment on that as well. There's a beautiful write up um, about the the use of guidelines in Brazil and adaptation of guidelines in the Lancet that I recommend everybody yes. to read that yeah. um, um, highlights a lot of these, these mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. um, and how guidelines were actually blocked um, in Absolutely. Brazil. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's important to remember that uh, distrust in science has always existed. It's a normal reaction to, you know, to be skeptical. That's a good thing. It's kept us alive as humans or throughout history. Uh, I'm pretty sure the day after Jenner did his first smallpox vaccine, there was probably a couple of people with picket signs outside his house. You know, this is normal. Uh, I'm from Montreal. In Montreal in 1905, uh, we had the biggest smallpox outbreak, one of the biggest in the world. One third of the entire population marched in an anti-vaccine march. We don't have anything near that today. So let's not overstate how bad the problem is. I think the problem today is twofold. Once is, is people have a much bigger megaphone, it's called the internet. And the most important one is it's been, misinformation has been weaponized yes. by people like Bolsonaro, by Trump for political gain. Uh, Russian bot farms. You know, we get this impression, I spend a little too much time on Twitter, get, them, get this impression there's a lot of anti-vax people. There's a tiny, tiny percentage and it's just blown up. So I think that's what we have to make people understand is who's doing this and why. That's, that's the different thing. And I think that has to be exposed. This is very, very bad for democracy, but skepticism is good. It's good for science. Uh, it's good that some people doubt vaccines. I don't have a problem with that at all. But why are they doing it is, is the important one. And I think the public needs to know more about that. So I don't overstate the problem, but don't uh, understate why it's being done. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nicholas. I'm a GP in Belgium and a guideline developer. Um, over the last, I think, five, six years, I've seen patients uh, get more and more access to their own medical records. So they can see all sorts of information, uh, discharge notes, all sorts of things. And there was, in the beginning, a lot of uh, sort of a, a concern that patients would not be able to understand all the information in these, in these research notes, in these discharge notes and, and things like that. And we've noticed that besides some, some small examples. That in, in general, patients are quite well at reading and understanding things that are not, in say, aimed at them. Eh? And in Belgium, we spend a lot of time and resources in trying to translate clinical guidelines for, for physicians into layperson information leaflets. Eh? But could there be a case made that maybe we don't need to have different communication strategies but just need to have one communication strategy that everyone understands? Maybe I just, uh, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Uh, I think um, it was probably about seven years ago. So um, uh, one of my colleagues that I'm working on doing the um, testing and user testing and randomized control trials in these different populations, um, we, we actually, she suggested that, that actually these, uh, all these versions, um, perhaps we're, we're making too many versions. I think uh, translating simply, yes, but there may, what we are finding is the why might be a little different. So a policymaker needs a different uh, uh, understanding of, of the rationale versus a patient would, it might be framed in a different way. Um, so those, those whys might be different to provide. Um, but a simple translation, absolutely agree. Um, the healthcare professionals, many times we're, we're trialing the plain language version with healthcare professionals and they prefer that version. So, I agree.
Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I have, oh, there's another question, sorry, that was just against the light there. Hi, Emily Vela, Program in Evidence-Based Care from McMaster University. Just uh, picking up on that point, is there a way we can bombard that information? Because, <laughs> like, when I was looking for information on McMaster, at McMaster University, why do we have mask mandates? There was no information. There was no transparency of that. Um, for example, the truckers, why, why do they have to get vaccines? No transparency. I couldn't find it because I have family members, too, that don't want to get vaccinated. So I was just trying to figure out how can we be transparent? And I feel like if we send a message to policymakers, whoever is making a mandate, you can link to the um, e-COVID web map or something like that, right? To say, not just say, we have evidence, but to actually say where the evidence is. We are making this mandate based on evidence and then point to where it is. I just feel like there's no integration there, um, well, at least within Ontario. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is an important point. I often say this about public health. Public health is very preachy. They act like a religion. You know, we're going to tell you what to do and you should just accept it. And that's not modern life. They should be able, they should have to back things up. Even though, you know, vaccination is pretty obviously beneficial, but it should be backed up and they should be able to search sources because that small minority of anti-vaxxers are providing sources. They're bogus, but they're providing it. They're actually doing a better job of communication. And that's why we're having trouble vaccinating people. They're much, much better telling their stories. They make it about people. Uh, they're not preachy. They make it sound like, you know, they're open-minded, which they're not. They, they do the communication excessively well, and they do it well because they have a pecuniary gain. You know, uh, there's always this bad-mouthing pharma makes money. Anti-vax people make way more money. Dr. Mercola's of the world, that guy is a scammer, scammer of the highest order. He's a multi-multi-millionaire selling bogus crap. And we have to talk about that. No, we have to just not say, oh, well, just get vaccinated. He's a bad person. It's way more complex than that. Thank you. I will um, pose one more question. So the tuberculosis example is a great example, I think, for a number of things. Um, tuberculosis is, outside of the pandemic, the number one infectious disease killer um, in the world. Um, and so I think what you laid out is, is quite striking, that the incidence of tuberculosis is pretty much directly related to inequity. So the more inequity there is, the more TB there is. Within countries and across countries. You know, it's a, a reminder of, of um, what one of our main themes here is. So inequity being directly related to these type of um, 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 conditions and problems. My question is, does that, how does that relate to being able to educate people? We're talking about education to, the, to a large um, degree here, information, um, pro, um, providing information, but educating people to understand that information. So how are we going to tackle that information about guidelines? Andre, you referred to it a little bit um, in your talk. How are, we going, how are we going to do that piece? What guidelines mean? Um, where they are coming from. So this educational piece, are we just going to run courses for people um, to know about guidelines? Are we going to teach people in schools? Um, I have a few ideas, but I wonder what the panel thinks. <laughs> well, uh, again, I, I think that the, the, the community advisory boards do a great job. For example, when they are engaged in, in, in certain studies or they follow up, they then uh, by helping, educating, and, and, and creating capacities. I mean, uh, it is um, in, in the scenario of, of, uh, of increasing poverty that we are seeing, more concentration of wealth, et cetera, and, um, and a, a, a increase of, of disparities and inequities, uh, uh, still uh, focusing on having community representatives and people uh, from different parts uh, participating in, um, in uh, following up studies and educating them slowly about the studies and making understand the importance not only of studies but uh, how do we ap apply for, for the guidelines, how do we implement the best guidelines and bring the information so what, what 
is the information that people will need and how, uh, how they will process that information. This is critical. I, I, uh, I, uh, one of the cabs that I uh, coordinated in India, in, in Ahmedabad, I was, um, uh, in the beginning I was really uh, shocked because uh, the, basically there were completely, absolutely grassroots people. There were some people linked to the municipality, uh, but also people working in slums, etc. And they were, uh, they were doing such a powerful uh, job, I um, mean, informing the communities and informing about treatment, uh, uh, treatment uh, literacy and uh, uh, informing them how to, to, to take the medication to, per uh, to perceive, uh, because the, the, the treat, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the TB treatment is almost torture. Uh, so uh, how to keep the, 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 the people in, in treatment and not uh, to abandon it. Um, and to support and to provide a care. One of the big discussions along many studies that we had was the, um, was the, the, uh, the need to, to supply uh, with food uh, those uh, in treatment. So this is uh, it's a clear message, those in treatment, and that has direct relation with, uh, so uh, we can have the best diagnostic method. We can have the best uh, 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 therapeutic combination. If there is no food and no, uh, no conditions, uh, it, the people will just not take it because they cannot be vomiting every day and, I mean, and, and, and having the sensation that they are getting worse. Well, uh, I, have, I had TB twice and, and in, in, in AIDS uh, 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 treatment failure, so I know how difficult that is. Um, so, I mean, it is, uh, for somebody who has no, no condition, it's, it's incredibly challenging. So I think, again, we should focus on, on small groups that can provide, uh, uh, to have impact in their communities, in the, and they can have a fabulous impact uh, uh, with the communities, with the, with the, uh, the, the, the local programs, with the, administra uh, the administration, and also on the higher level. So this, this simple people can be playing an incredible, uh, uh, incredible role. And they are there. They are willing to participate. They are, they are, they are seeking for information. They, 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 they absorb the information. They are so happy to be, to be considered. Now in the, in, the, in the dissemination of the study results, I mean, it was funny because somebody in Uganda was saying like some, some and in South Africa as well, I have the same, that uh, some, some trial participants bring the entire family to hear to hear the, 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 the results because they were excited about uh, uh, learning science and being participating in that. So in, including them is powerful and is useful for each one of you. Thank you, Etsy. Thank you very much. Also, you know, we are reminded of the passion um, um, that um, often drives, um, drives uh, progress and you're exhibiting this passion in an incredible way. Um, so um, thank you for that. I wonder if, um, and I think it's a superb strategy, to be, to be honest, to think about that in the context of guidelines, the community engagement in the way that you're describing it. Andre or Nancy, um, any final comments on this topic? I, I think education has to be largely organic. You know, we have to want to be to learn. So I think you can educate small groups, but I don't think you can educate a full public. I think you have to make them aware of issues uh, to talk about the media. The media is not in the job of education, it's in the job of information, and those are very different things, so we expect too much of the media. Uh, something like tuberculosis in Canada, uh, it's relevant. You know, who has tuberculosis in Canada? Indigenous peoples, mostly in the north. Uh, this, uh, I think one of the silver linings of COVID is that we talk openly now about social determinants of health. Why did, you know, who got COVID in Canada? Uh, racialized people, older people, all marginalized people. So I think it's, primed us for that discussion. Uh, in Canada, I think t tuberculosis is about reconciliation. How can we allow one population to have this horrible middle-aged disease in, in the 21st century? So it's about context education. And I, I think we have primed the pump a bit on this one to, to make it uh, something we talk about. Uh, the final part is we have to remember tuberculosis rates have soared during COVID. It's a, one of the big collateral damage of, of the pandemic, and we have to talk about that. Well, what's the impact of that? I think it's going to be ultimately bad for the economy, bad for business. We're going to rely on, on people uh, in the world who are uh, 
at risk of tuberculosis to be our future workforce. So we have a vested interest in that. Uh, the last thing I think I always say to people who advocate, speak the language of people you're advocating to. So the language of politics is money. Make this about money. This is going to harm our workforce. It's going to harm our future economy. If you want to be selfish about it, that's one way to sell it. Or you can sell it on the compassionate issue. But I think we need a bit of both. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Nancy, any final comment? Okay, then um, we... Is it a quick point? Maybe, <laughs> I hope so. Maybe, maybe it's not, it needs to be quick. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll make it quick then, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mitchell van Doma from the Physiotherapy Association in the Netherlands. Um, thank you first for uh, your in very interesting presentations and discussion. We talked a lot about uh, providing information to the, uh, to the patients, but I'm also really interested in your point of view about how uh, recommendations can contribute to uh, the shared decision making between a patient uh, uh, and a clinician. That's something different than providing information. Yeah, I guess, yeah, um, I guess I would, I think it again goes back to the why and that's what we saw that, you know, there's probably more need for shared decision making with the conditional recommendations, although you still speak to your patient with the strong recommendations, um, but that's what they wanted to know, like, so why, and then when you're explaining these were, it was because of these benefits, because of these harms that might happen, because of the cost, then I think that's how, where the, it comes in and can be uh, communicated. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks so much. Um, so, the best meeting has to come to an end. We are almost at the end of this meeting. Um, I think from this session, no, you stay here um, for just a second. So I think from this session, the summary might be that, first of all, transparency is key. I think you taught us that, um, that on occasion, less precise information, such as telling people what the best action may be um, in a more black and white fashion um, may be appropriate, but be always prepared to also provide that background, the onion, and possibly make people cry, hopefully not. Um, the, um, the, I think the other message is to admit the uncertainty. Um, Andre made the point that um, this is totally appropriate and possibly also wanted by the, by the public. And um, education and co-production. I think Ezio is reminding us of co-production, of research, maybe the guidelines, probably the guidelines, I would say, um, that that may be key and that there is some work to be done in terms of how we can educate people. So that's um, perhaps my closure, my summary of this session. I wanted to end with a round of applause to, for this really brilliant <laughs>
Uh, we also have people joining us online uh, uh, who, who may not have been able to come, so thank you to those. Uh, we, we, in, in the room today, there are uh, representatives from 38 countries, and we have a guidelines international network, so I think that is a really, really uh, a good outcome. And the scientific program, the, the plenary sessions, I think, have been great. They've been interesting, but also somewhat challenging, I think, and, and asked us to question some of our assumptions uh, and what we do, um, and particularly to focus on equity, which I think has, has really come through the program. So uh, I think they've been really interesting. But the concurrent programs and trying to choose which, which stream to go to, I think, is just a credit to how interesting all of the submissions from all of you were. Uh, sometimes the rooms were quite full because they are very popular, but you know it's good. I think that's a good thing. Um, and of course, we had uh, some in-guide training as well. And um, what's not mentioned here is the, uh, the actual social program. And on Wednesday night, how long have we been here? Wednesday night? It was just amazing to see the buzz in the room at the welcome reception as everyone was coming back together, um, you know, we were a little bit cautious, hugging, maybe, maybe not. Um, but to see people who we haven't seen for a few years, or to actually meet people in real life um, who we've only ever known on Twitter or on Zoom, um, I think that's been one of the greatest benefits of this, of this actual conference. And so we were a little bit cautious, you know, I think on Wednesday, but I think a lot of that caution had gone uh, out with the wind by last night. Uh, when we saw the fantastic dance floor and the great band uh, and some really great dancing styles. Um, I was a little bit worried about getting on there until the lights came down, but didn't worry everyone else. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, so I do have some thank yous I just wanted to uh, go through today because obviously a huge amount of effort and work goes into putting on an event like this. Uh, firstly, I want to thank the, the scientific committee, uh, which has been led by Holger and Milislav. I mentioned earlier in the week that uh, this is probably one of the longest scientific committees, I think, for a conference. They actually formed back in 2019, I think was the first meeting of a scientific committee, and have been meeting uh, throughout the pandemic, making alternate plans. Um, so congratulations to the scientific committee, particularly Milislav and, and Holger for their leadership. So please join me in thanking the scientific community. Now, in terms of the, the local hosts and McMaster, the actual, they've actually been working even longer than the scientific committee. I think it was four years ago that they started working on the proposal to have us here. And who would have known the whole world would have changed over that four years. So. I've seen a lot of the volunteers here today and throughout the conference as well. A huge amount of work from Holger and Nancy and, and the team at McMaster. So once again, please join me in thanking the local host. Uh, the conference committee uh, as well. I, I don't know if Duncan's in the room. Is Duncan, Duncan here? He might not be, but Duncan chaired the conference committee and obviously they had a lot to do and a lot to meet about as well. Our abstract review committee, I know a lot of you in the room were members of that abstract review committee and it wasn't an easy task. Uh, there were so many abstracts and a high, high quality abstract, so thank you. Um, our plenary speakers as well. Our PCO team uh, who, are, who are floating around, um, thank you for all your work uh, putting this together. I need to mention a gin secretariat as well and particularly I'd like to mention uh, Elaine, uh, our, our CEO, who has done an amazing amount of work and shepherded the conference as well. So thank you Elaine and Alison, uh, who's our conference manager. So please thank both of those. And I think I've mentioned our volunteers also. Uh, and we can't have these types of events without our sponsors, and EBSCO have been very generous to come on as our platinum sponsor, and we are incredibly grateful for, for their support. Um, and thank you to everyone who visited the sponsors as well at, at, the, at the booths in the exhibition. Um, we also have a, a number of other sponsors as well um, who, are, who are shown on this slide. Please join me in thanking the sponsors as well for their supporting the conference. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say, really. Just thank you. It's been amazing to see you all. Uh, I'm going to introduce Holger in a second. Do you mind sitting down for a tick, Holger? He's, he's going to have some reflections on the scientific program and also announce the poster winners. 
But we just wanted to quickly acknowledge, I think, Holger's efforts in leading this conference, um, making it come to fruition over four years. And just a very, very quick story. Even, even just this, this morning, um, we realised we didn't have a chair for the plenary session. Uh, Jill was, Jill was by, by herself and could have done it fantastically. Uh, but we didn't have one. And then last minute, you know, Holger said, I, it's, you know, he was asked to do it if he could do it. It's probably the last thing anyone wants to do, at, you know, in, early on a Friday after a long, long conference. But Holger said, yeah, I, I can do it. And I think that just goes to show he's, he's been doing, stepping in, helping out, and he's been doing it for four years. You know, all of the challenges that have come up with having this event in Toronto. In 2020, when we were meant to have the event, we actually had an online pit stop, it was called, and Holger led that as well, so we, the team have actually put on two conferences. So I, I just want to say thank you once again to Holger. We actually have a little gift for you, but yes, please join me, thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, the, the, apparently somebody knows that I like to cycle, so um, I was jumping up because this is not part of the program that I was uh, informed about. So, Zach, I really appreciate that. Um, it's really on behalf of the team. We've, um, uh, we probably feel very privileged that we, that we had the chance to host everybody and I'm um, extremely pleased that you've all made the way. Uh, it's a great cycling place. Um, so if anybody wants to go out cycling with me or the next week, um, do that. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks, Zach. Well, I really you, appreciate Robert. it. But it's on behalf of the team. Yeah. Um, Okay, that was unexpected um, because I was so excited to announce the winner of the best um, um, poster prize. Uh, wanted to say one more thing, and that is that I don't take necessarily responsibility, but I, I feel um, that we should acknowledge those who uh, um, didn't have necessarily have the chance to, to be in some sessions um, because the, the rooms were so full. Um, it was a bit difficult to predict. Uh, it's probably an expression of, of, um, you know, of the interest that existed for some of the sessions. So um, as I said, apologies for that. It was difficult to predict. And also, I know that there was at least one session or one person that was cut off um, because of some scheduling issues. I apologize for that. Uh, that happens when you run a big conference. So um, nevertheless, everything else was great, um, in my view at least. And um, that brings me to the poster, the best poster, the, the greatest poster. Um, I'm really happy to invite um, Omer up to the stage for his um, poster on um, Medical, medical cannabis use for chronic pain, a systematic assessment of equity consideration, and it's so befitting, so um, um, it fits so well with our, with our theme. So, um, Omar, congratulations. Thank you. It's really, it's really great. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this award. I'm truly honored, uh, and a special thanks to my mentor, Vivian Welsh, and Peter Tugwell, I don't know where he is, Love you guys. And uh, the whole center, Ottawa Center for Global Health and anyone who has ever taught me anything. Um, and yeah, thank you for the gin organizers for making such a you know, friendly and environmentally diverse uh, conference for new researchers like myself. Yeah, that's it. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks. Your prize is a free registration for InGuide. Um, so that will be in some way made available to you. So thanks, Omar. I um, would like to bring it back to, um, um, yeah, Elaine. Elaine as our CEO. So don't forget to fill out the conference evaluation. Over Thank to you. you. <laughs> thanks, Holger and Zach. Okay. So once again, thank you all very, very much for coming and for your participation. Um, as is tradition, the final thing that we, we do before we close the, the conference is to tell you a little bit about next year. And June 2023 will be slightly different, quite 
quite a bit different, actually. Um, it will be a fully organised, um, sorry, a conference fully organised by Jin. Um, we made up our minds at really quite tight notice, just in May this year, the, the Jin board got together for the first time in three years, um, and we talked about what we would do for 2023. And it's been decided to do a fully hybrid conference. So we will be organising this. We have looked at sustainability. Um, obviously, we still need a, a venue. We need a location for it to be based in. We considered five locations. Um, within the locations, we then looked at the next level down, which was the, the venues. And they needed to be fully hybrid capable. And then the final decision, as always, has to be the financial viability of it. So, next year, we are going to go to Glasgow, 2023. As anyone who visited the Gin's booth during this conference will already know, so it's not a huge surprise. The dates will be 19 to 22nd of September, and it's going to be at the University of Strathclyde Technical, Technology and Innovation Centre, which is a, a super um, purpose-built conference centre. And the registration will open in January. So we hope that you will join us in Glasgow. Um, and if not, then virtually, where we hope to give you a great experience online as well. The picture that you see in the, um, or the building that you see in that picture is Glasgow City Halls. And that will be where our welcome reception will take place. Um, and you will see a little bit more of Glasgow in just a second. So that video will be made uh, available on our website. The building that you see within it, um, the, the Kelvin Grove Art, Art Gallery and Museum, is where we'll have our big networking dinner. So we will hope to see as many of you as possible there. Um, the dates, as I said, the 19th to 22nd of September next year. So I hope everyone's excited about it. <laughs> So my final task today is to welcome Larry Frost up to the podium once again, our Indigenous Elder, who will give us a closing prayer. I was sitting there for a while, but you know what? This is awesome. This is really good. I couldn't wait to get here this morning, so it's great. So I won't hold you up because I know you want to go home. <laughs> but anyway, I want to say to the creator that he or she, because someone told me yesterday, it might be a she. I said, okay, guide you home safely. But, so with that, I'll do a closing prayer, okay? Kichi Manitou, great creator, we are so grateful for all of the information and direction that has been gifted to us over this time at this conference. As we remember all of the aspects of health and wellness, may we turn into this wisdom and share that in the best way we know how. We now have a vision for how to walk forward. Help us to move in this into the world of all people, for all of our relations. We close our space with gratitude. Take a moment, place your hand on your heart, 
and now think about all the things you are grateful for in this life. Gather all your blessings into your heart and mind. Envision the land that we are standing on and send a gratitude from your heart to the land. Send thanks for all the blessings that the earth offers you. Send thanks for all of the beauty that touches your life. And of course, send thanks for this time we have shared together here for the, was it three days or four days that you were. So what at that, I say chimigwidj and have a safe journey at home. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. You know, one thing about here, I feel so confident I could talk for hours. <laughs> Bye. Well, thank you very much, Larry. That was very much appreciated, and it's lovely to take a minute or two just at the end of the conference to bring us all back down um, and to just think about what life's really about. So thank you all very, very much. I will now bring June 2022 to a close and look forward to seeing you all in Glasgow this time next year. Thank you. Thank you.